that. So why co-fermentation? So we kind of, um, all of our experiments today have to do with co-fermentation. Um, and the, the thing that we kind of, that, that brought a lot of this, of us to this, is that, you know, co-fermentation basically is something that any of us can do. Um, but there's some things, some questions to think about as we are kind of deciding what to, what to co-ferment along the way. So technically co-fermentation is just the simultaneous fermentation of two or more varieties in the same vessel. So um, that could be two red varieties, it could be two white varieties, um, and some of the ones that I think we, we feel like are kind of most, most interesting sometimes are the ones where we have red and white varieties working together. Um, so before we go much further, actually, I'm gonna jump out of this real quick. That didn't seem to work. There we go. So about that. So in the chat box, who who here has done co-fermentation? And if you've co-fermented, what have you co-fermented? You can kind of say like oh, we co-fermented this, and maybe like one sentence as to like what you were trying to accomplish in that particular co-fermentation. Um, as you guys are typing into the chat box, I'll sort of share at least one experience of so when I was at WineWorks, we would co-ferment periodically. We had a, a field that had a lot of sort of these, it was kind of an experimental field that had some Italian red varieties that never really got fully ripe. So it was like Sangiovese and Nebbiolo and Rafasco all sort of in one field together. Um, and so we started to, to do a field pick of that and co-ferment all of those as rosé at one time. So in that case, um, really it was, it was kind of a practical consideration. None of them were really enough to make a, a whole big fermentation on its own, um, but for that particular application, um, they were kind of ripe enough at the same time to get them to all go. Um, so it looks like uh, we've got Syrah with Viognier. So Michael Henney, that's Syrah with Viognier. That's a, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your, why you would do your Syrah with Viognier? Yeah, yeah, so um, at, at Horton, we grew Syrah in Viognier, and I, I, I too was in trance with like the Northern Rhone and the, you know, the, you know, the re reading about the miracle of co, -co with the coptaric acid that the white grapes have, and it's supposed to make the wine darker and all that. And that, 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 that was at some early WRE trials. And, um, you know, we, we never saw the magic of getting the darker color, and I can't say the mouthfeel was improved. And personally i didn't care for the aromatic contribution brought to the red wine context um but i was always looking for ways um to to, to, to uh look, look, look into being a more of an extractive co context um so that's that's what led, led to that cool great so rick let's try and see if you can if you can unmute yourself rick tell us a little about your merlot and petite men saying Rick, are you there? And look, I can, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you, there you yeah. are. Oh my goodness, well, uh, you have to mute me quick because I'll ask a stupid question. Anyway, <laughs> um, I did Merlot and Petit Mansang, and it really wasn't a controlled kind of thing. It was our annual bucket full of grapes and have people stomp them with their feet. So uh, we had some Merlot that had, I don't know if it had issues or not, it just didn't get real, real ripe. And I had Petit Man Sang that did get real, real ripe. So it was about two thirds Merlot and one third Petit Man Sang. It turned out okay. Okay. So uh, um, I didn't so want another one. Imbi so it was still a, it was still a red wine, but it was like a like it was like a rosé. Like a rosé. It was more yeah. like a rosé. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it didn't the the grapes didn't get really really pressed very hard because people would walk in them for five or ten minutes and. Um, get tired of it so right it was it, 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 we didn't get a lot of color but it was a, it turned out i mean I, I i can't really remember it was a long time ago but it seemed like it was a good idea philosophically or uh, th that the blend would work mm -hmm. but and but once you put a foot in there people really don't take it too seriously so right but well, it was good i think it was good <laughs> nice. sorry i just had a conversation about foot stomping the other day so we'll we'll do that another time Okay, and it looks like in the chat, it looks like we've got lots of people who have done basically Chamberson with other red varieties. And I think we'll talk about that um, even more today. So, um, okay, so let's go ahead and jump in then. We will come back here. 
if we can go where I need to go. Okay, so again, so co-fermentation, we can kind of put all kinds of different varieties together um, and there might be different reasons for that. So as we've just said, sometimes that's for aroma or flavor enhancement, something that's kind of not giving us very much to begin with and we wanna add something in there. There is that idea of color enhancement and Michael Henney just brought that up a minute ago that there's this um, phenomenon that sometimes can happen even when you're adding a white variety to red grapes that, um, that you actually get a little bit enhancement in color and, and that the phenomenon is called co-pigmentation. And the idea there is that um, the color molecules themselves are essentially kind of stabilized and held in a more colored form by having some other phenolics around. So the idea is if you have a variety that doesn't have a lot of those other phenolics to hold it in place, if you co-ferment with another variety that does have those, you might be able to stabilize um, some of your color. So even though it might be counterintuitive to ask to add white with, with red, sometimes you can actually get more color out of it. Mathieu? You ever seen it happen? Because every time I try to do some fermentation, the one with uh, the white varietal always was lighter in, in color, no matter what. So right. I've, I've heard the theory too, but in reality, I never witness it. Okay. It's yeah. The same here. Yeah. Right. I, I think we'll we'll have one example today where there might be a hint of that happening, um, and maybe when we see that, we'll talk a little bit more about when it might happen or when it might not happen. Um, so another reason though that we might have co-fermentation is just interplanted vineyards and. You know, I, I gave the example of, of when we had the vineyard that had kind of this test plot. Um, but you can kind of think too about, you know, traditionally when vineyards, when you're roguing vines or that sort of thing, you're kind of just, re sometimes you're just replanting with what you can get. Um, there's a couple of, of kind of uh, famous examples of these in Napa that are kind of these older vineyards that have been interplanted. Um, that now I think the, the Buckland Vineyard had uh, 16 different varieties and 12 acres and they take it as one sort of big, field plot. Um, my husband and I were in Napa a few years ago, went to the one of Ridge's vineyards. Um, that's kind of the same thing. It's mostly Zinfandel, but it's got some Carignan and then some Syrah, and they sort of take that together and co-ferment it. So this idea, sometimes you, you have this interplanted vineyard and it's just um, practically easier and, and or you like the result of when it happens. Um, so to get back to Mathieu's point though about about co-fermentation, when we look at the, public, the published studies about whether co-fermentation actually gives us that color bump, even in the publications, Matthew, it seems like it really does depend on what varieties are being used in combination, um, that you're not always gonna get that, that it's really only in this very specific situation where you might have, um, where you might have that particular setup of things. So Bruce is raising his hand here, so I'm gonna see if I can, give him the chance to talk. Bruce, can you, did, can you unmute yourself? Do you have something to add yeah. there? I, I think you probably uh, have I, insight for us. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I, just to Matthew's point, the co-pigmentation is not a uh, permanent or static issue. So for example, the most uh, vibrant or uh, uh, most uh, significant co pigment analog is arginine and so if you, if you are uh, say cold soaking and if you have have looked at this when you're cold soaking you can it looks like you get a lot more color than you ended up with in the finished wine and that's because the arginine is acting as a cold as a uh, cofactor but that changes with fermentation in other words that bond is not permanent Right, but I mean, and I think so. So the so the co co pigmentation phenomenon can be transitory. I guess that's my bottom right. line. Right. So you just might, to, and I think that like when we the stuff that I was reading, Bruce also just would say basically like you would ex, you would see this more in younger wines, and as wines age out, you don't see it as much. Right. Um, and I guess the question is, is when we're looking at wines right now, does that that still counts as a younger wine though? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that as we look at our experiments going forward and see what the effect is on the color. So you guys have the ones you can look at the color, but we also have quantitative numbers for that as well. So, okay, so um, let's see, I've got one more in Q and... 
So somebody is asking if all the slides are available for download after the meeting. I can certainly make those available so you don't have to worry about screenshotting or anything like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into Doug's experiment then. So Doug, do you, we'll, we'll have slides for your experiment in just a minute, but let's just talk for a minute. Um, can you talk about a little bit about what approach you took and why you were interested in doing this co-fermentation experiment to begin with? Sure. So, you know, I, it really, for me, it goes back to uh, Wineries Unlimited many years ago, uh, talking with Mike Fiore up in uh, uh, Northern Maryland. And he always, you know, he liked the Chambresin and he always embraced the co-fermentation. So, um, we, when I was at Tarara, we didn't really, we did Chambresin as a blender. It never was really anything. It was always treated as a second, second class citizen. And um, I just started playing with it. And there I started a uh, Chamberson wine and it did well. And, and it's always been a part of our lineup. Um, I'm looking for, I kind of call it a, a bistro style wine. Um, I get some compliments on saying it's similar to Montepulciano when I hit it. Um, you know, and having either, sometimes it's Cab Franc, I've done it with Merlot, I've done it with Cab, uh, with uh, Tanat was when I had a good chunk of that, it was nice to do that. Um, but it gives it the body that you're looking for. There's just something about Chamberson in the back end that I always feel is lacking. And yeah. um, it's a beautiful wine on its own without that piece. But to have it food friendly and to fit in the style that I'm looking for, um, I feel like that's how I've been successful at, at, at playing with this. So we added the element of the uh, Vidal skins to try this year. So what the three wines are uh, the Control, the Vidal skins, and then the Merlot skins. And that was the Merlot was picked because that was what was available when the Chamberson was ready to come in. Okay, so stay with me. We'll talk through the slides together, but I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen so that we can see the slides as well, because um, we'll start to talk about some of the data um, here in a minute. So, okay. So when we look at this experiment then, Doug, I remember you and I were sitting around your table and it was after 2018 and you were saying, you know, in 2018, Chamberson was like one of the only reds that really held up. And so we started to talk just about what you were saying there and like, how do we make Chamberson a, a better standalone blend? And if you have lots of Chamberson, even is there a way to kind of do different types of Chamberson so that you can kind of make multiple products out of the same thing, if that's gonna have to be the base of things. Um, so as Doug said, basically the setup here is that there were three different T-bins. One got 100% Chamberson, one got 85% Chamberson and 15% Vidal pumice. So basically the Vidal was pressed, um, that went into juice, and then the pumice that was left was used in this co-fermentation. Um, and, and then the third one got about 80, got 85% Chamberson and 15% Merlot pumice. So that the difference there being after the Merlot had been fermented and pressed, then the pumice from that was added back. Um, so again, Doug, can you can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to use Vidal in this? in this particular experiment? Well, the Vidal has always had a little bit of tannin structure to it. Um, obviously, it's another one that is um, available here in Virginia, um, more than Viognier, and Viognier has the classic one there with that. We played it around with it uh, at other times, and I said, well, that's the easy pick if we're gonna try one. Uh, let's see what it does, and, um, and that's how we got it. Okay. And you kind of already addressed this, but what about the Merlot? So the Merlot, was it? Yeah, so the Merlot had come in at a matter of timing. Um, the, uh, the, the Chamberston was ready to go. Um, it, you know, that vineyard was just at that breakdown point, and I didn't want to push it. Um, and the Cab Franc, uh, I think, had just come in. So we didn't have that available as, a, as the skins. So we were able to, to utilize the Merlot that we had just pressed off the day before. So Great. And then one other thing I wanted to throw at that we tried to figure out. So the 15% Vidal pumice was a swag on what would be roughly 15% of the total skins. 
okay, uh, rather than weight wise, we didn't throw in 50% of Vidal uh, skins versus um, what, what we matched up. So did that, that make sense? I think we talked about that, Joy, but that's how we kind of came up with that between you, Karen, and I. Okay. Yeah. Does that – okay. Yeah, that, thank you for that clarification. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand. So, so rather than the overall weight, you calculated how much of that would generally be skin and added 15% more skin? Is that what you're saying, Doug? Correct. Um, and, and I think this, the conversation here also just brings up sort of the, the sort of logistical things with co-fermentation. So um, just listening to Doug talk about that, that, um, you know, you're always trying to think about things that would basically be ready at the same time. And so sometimes it's complicated by that. Doug, can you talk just a little bit about like when you, I, when you're, when you're pressing, like, I think your, your Vidal, you pressed and then you had like a day before you actually added it to the Merlot. So what kind of precautions did you take in the middle there just to make sure that that, that Well, we, uh, again, we did the best we could. Um, so what we did, we had a cooler, we were able to put it in there. I did add some, uh, some SO2, um, closed it up, gassed it. Um, but I think I did make in my notes that I felt like it was a little warm. I think that thing started cooking on its own. Okay. Um, so our yeast, um, maybe is, is a mystery on that one. Um, but what we did at least as far as what may have started the, the, the doll, when we did our yeast addition to this, we, from, we started the fermentation right away because we knew stuff was cooking. And with the Merlot, the, we used that yeast, okay? And we used that yeast to add to the straight Chamberson and to the Chamberson Vidal because we knew that the, the Merlot skins were loaded with that yeast. And I can't even remember what it is. I know it's written yeah. down somewhere. Right. Um, but the idea was don't worry about if you're going to co ferment with skins. Don't worry about buying extra yeast for the Chamberson. You're going to introduce all that yeast that was in the skins from whatever your co-fermentation skin is. Right. And uh, Doug, with your Vidal, um, had that been destemmed? Was there any stem component from the Vidal? And was it no, we did not do a stem component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And had, had the Vidal been cr crushed or whole cluster pressed? Yeah, it was a, it was a crush process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So destem and crush. Okay. Yeah, so, so that brings up again that, that idea of preserving, so SO2, and then if you're a person who uses ketosan or non-saccharomyces yeast, those also might be things that would help you if you had to sort of go overnight. As Doug said, keeping that, that pumice cold, keeping it gassed, again, you know, trying to keep it from starting to ferment in ways you don't want it to. And, and all of the reports for these are, are posted on the website, and I can add them to the chat. In a few minutes, but um, basically, if you want to know, I, I actually don't remember the yeast that you used either. But I remember that we clarified to make sure that it was going to be the same yeast used in all three fermentations, um, and that that would be the same thing that was used on the Merlot. So just a point of, of reference there. Okay, so let's sort of take a look at what the chemistry gives us. If I can get this to advance. Okay, so chemistry-wise, um, I did. The, the Chamberson itself was at about 21.6 bricks when it came in. I included the chemistry on the Vidal there in case we saw some chemistry shifts and wondered if that, in the Vidal fermentation, and wondered if that had anything to do with it. When we look at the fermentation kinetics themselves, it does look like the, the Merlot took off a little bit faster, and that makes a lot of sense given what Doug was just saying, and that you essentially have inoculated it with this, you know, this bit of yeast to begin with. Doug, I have one question for you there. It does look like your, your temperatures are fairly different. So the Merlot kind of got, got cold really fast. Looks like the Vidal is, is, or I mean, got hot really fast. It looks like the Vidal is a lot cooler. Do you feel like that's just because you were adding that, those cold skins on there? Or do you, was there something else that you noticed in that fermentation? Um, you know, that, that thing just, it, it clicked through so quickly. Um, okay. You know, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the day span there, you know, that thing, that thing just rock bottomed within, you know, within five or, or you know, what's that, five days. Yeah. So I don't remember anything specific with that and whether that was, you know, how, how it didn't seem like it was a significant difference. Okay. Um, then when we look at the wine chemistry itself, um, again, I think the, the one thing that stands out to me in the wine chemistry is the difference in the pH between the three. 
Um, and we'll see that and just that that'll become important when we talk about color in just a minute. But um, the, the Vidal did have a lower, uh, enough of a lower pH that that might be a, a notable thing. And then the Merlot even lower than that. Um, so we do see a, a, the pH shift there, which we need to keep in mind when we look at the color um, component, which is right here. So Matu, you were asking about, you know, have we ever seen that shift? And, and in this case, if we look at just the Chamberson and then we look at the Chamberson Vidal, it does look like the Chamberson Vidal actually does have a little bit higher color. Now we don't know how, how that would look if we did, you know, five of these fermentations to see if we had that. It's not a huge difference. Um, but in this case, again, you would expect to have dilution of color and we don't see that. Um, and again, color could be because of uh, a little bit because of that pH shift as well. So the lower pH gives us higher color, but the Merlot also has lower pH and doesn't have higher color. Uh, can I interject? Uh, yeah. it's, it's also, uh, it's a co-fermentation, but it's more of a, a skin addition than a co yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. meaning like it makes yeah. sense that your color is more. Merlot is already done. Yeah. <laughs> It makes yes. it makes sense that, that you're you're you've got more color because you added more skin to the uh, to the. Well, but you added white. You wouldn't. Why would you have more color if you added more Vidal skin? Vidal skin doesn't bring any color. I mean, maybe well, not more color. color pigmentation, possibly. Right, and that's where I. That's what I was seeing to Matthew. This might be that example of co-pigmentation, because if you look at the yes. anthocyanins, you have lower anthocyanins in. The, in both of the co-fermentations than you do in the Chamberlain itself. And that makes sense. As Rick said, your Merlot colors already, your Merlot anthocyanins have already been leached into the Merlot fermentation. So that's And there you can hear me. Yeah, do, do keep in mind that when you're looking at the spectral colors, the absorptions, those changes are not linear. So if you're measuring that at native pHs, which in this case are different pHs, you're naturally going to get different uh, spectrums, different uh, absorptions at those those uh, um, three different pHs. Well, but Bruce, the I mean, you would think that the lower the pH, the more color you're going to have, and the Merlot has lower pH than well than, uh, the, the Vidal, right? So that shift can't just be about pH. The spectral color is one thing. I think I'd make the judgments on, on color potential based on the anthocyanin content <clears throat> and particularly the uh, relationship between the total anthocyanins, polymeric anthocyanins, and your, um, your polymeric ratios. Is there, a, well, okay. So let's let's look at the so winemakers, you guys have the wines in front of you. So I'm gonna get out of share for here a minute. You guys have the wines in front of you. Um, what what do they first of all, can you when you look at them, do you see differences in what they in what the color looks like? Yeah, for, for, for me, I got a slightly more color in the Vidal. Um, you know, it wasn't striking, but to me it was noticeable. And yeah, I, I I think the the color for me on on the Vidal uh, was a little bit more the orange side, so it was a little bit more orange, like orange. it was more brown. Uh, you know, it was a bit less purple. Okay. Um, I for me it was really close. I will say I like Matu's point that that it was a little bit more of that orange hue. Than the than the purple or the plum, but um, God, they were they were real close. It wasn't a huge difference. Right. Yeah. When I looked at them, it didn't seem different to me. We can look at the hue number. So the just that's the the ratio of the the four twenty to the five twenty. So we can look back at that and see as well. Um, okay. So what about I, other? I, Go ahead. I think one more thing with what Matt Matthews saying would make sense. Uh, just you know, when when you see Vidalis in in the bottom of tank, they've got a pretty funky ochre type type of color mm -hmm. that would uh, push the wine in that direction. That's true, and especially since they were destem, like you had a destem to begin with, your your skins might be a little bit chewed up. Um, what about other other sensory for you guys? Do you feel like um, 
how, do you feel, first of all, do you feel like the wines are different? And if so, what differences would you articulate about the wines? I will, uh, I, I will say that the, the, the wine with the Vidal for me is much more floral. And, uh, and in saying that, it's almost in, uh, something that I noticed on most of the uh, samples that we've done with co-fermentation is I find like, and I'm not saying that as a stereotype, but most of the wine that's been co-fermented with a white varietal, it's got a tendency for me to be more, more on the floral side. Uh, and, but I, I did not get that at all with a, with a Merlot, for example. Okay. For, 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 for me on the, on the Merlot, I, I got a little bit mustiness on, on it. I don't know, if, Doug, if, that's, uh, if you, you kind of pick, picked up on that, if that's from, you're talking about the Merlot was kick, uh, cooking a bit right away. I, I really love the that mouthfeel in the Vidal sample. I thought it was deeper, richer, softer acid. I thought, I thought re re really, really interesting wine that uh, I, I wouldn't expect that result. Yeah, I, I, I still on that. I did, I did prefer the Vidal, uh, the Vidal experimentation out of the three. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, I, the, the um, varietal character of the Chamberson Strait really showed through well. Um, and when I looked at the other two, I, I felt, I was definitely saw and felt the tannin structure and the differences there and the lack of structure in the, in the, um, uh, the control. But um, I don't know that I, maybe it would take a little more time to evaluate where I wanted to steer that wine. I, I felt that, that Vidal, it, it, it was unique. It, had, it showed some nice character, but I don't know if it was where I wanted to go with that wine. Um, and maybe as a blender, Maybe, you know, because I make the other wines, the, the Paco and some other things with that. So in that idea of what else can we make from Chamberson, I think that was one of the, the pros that I came out of that with. I liked the idea that it was something different. Um, and the Merlot, I think you, you, you stayed a little bit more on that red character, but not as, uh, you know, not as gamey as the, or, or punchy fruit as Chamberson can be. Doug, you've done some great work with Chamberson and Tanat through the years. Uh, is it Tanat just not kick, kick, kicking around at the right time? or uh... Mike, I got to get to Honolulu. You know, I got to go visit some of that Tanat <laughs> there again. But, um, yeah, it's a magical our, place, uh, that Honolulu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we got our butt kicked in that polar vortex. Yep. And I lost a lot of my estate Tanat. Um, and the others, I haven't, um, I haven't bid on it as hard and I've made small batches here and there. And by doing that, the timing hasn't always landed for the Chamberson. Yep. So this is why I kind of keep it a little bit loose, but, um, boy, when I, you know, some years, you know, that, that, that cannot just, just falling off the vine. There's so much of it. And, uh, you know, yeah, I'd love to catch it again. So thanks. Okay. Okay, any, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, I've got one in the Q&A. Uh, uh, Jeff Sanders is asking, what's the, what are the labeling rules when you, when you do this like Doug did with the skins but not the grapes? Have you thought about how to handle that labeling in terms of, do, do you worry about you know, uh, varietal difference there? Rules? We don't need no stinking rules. <laughs> well, but if you're going to blend that with something else. <laughs> no. Um, so I have not. I, I looked at it like you added in, you're taking it out. So I almost kind of looked at it. I did not. I did not. I'll be honest. I never looked it up to see what the heck they would want me to say. Um, I know that it's been a pretty common practice with other, other folks, and that's why I just dove into it. Um, but I, I look at it almost as a finding agent is that, yeah, you're, you're adding it, but it's coming out. There's no, there's no juice there. It's just skins. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if it depends too on what else you're, you're blending there. If you feel like you're getting close to any, any regular, like if it's mostly just Chamberson, then it, it doesn't, if you're not blending anything else in there, you're certainly not at 25% yet. Yeah. Okay. Other, any other questions for Doug before we, we move on? If, 
if you're trying to unmute yourself and you can't and you can't be heard yet, maybe if you raise your hand, I can certainly make sure that you can be heard. Or you can write in the chat. Um, okay, so Garrett Savage is asking any observed improvements or changes in mouthfeel. So did we, what did you all feel with the mouthfeel on these? Uh, for, 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 for me, I, I, absolutely, I really love, love the mouthfeel. Um, maybe from whatever the skins were contributing to the Rudolph Chamberson, and I, I got a perception of a lower acidity. I'm not sure what the, the chemistry is in there, but I thought for me it was a softer, broader, more integrated mouthfeel. Yeah, I agree. I felt like it was a soft, like there was a softening of the mouthfeel. Um, again, as Doug was saying, maybe that makes it less of a, a red wine and more of sort of that in between moves it away from that structured wine, but... Um, yeah, but at I, the same time, uh, I feel it turns down a little bit the acidity in a good way, because I feel, I feel like the, the Chambord on its own is very vertical, uh, and I think that makes the wine a bit wider and a bit more balanced, so I did prefer the... I, and I'm saying that for both of them, like the Merlot and, uh, and, uh, and Vidal, I did prefer the most feel of the Merlot and the Vidal both compared than just the Chambord on its own. Okay. Okay. Well, let and we'll keep that in mind as we move on to the other experiments as well, and we'll we'll try to make sure to address mouthfeel in these others. Um, okay. So, Michael Henny, do you want to tell us a little bit about the experiment that you did and what why you were interested in that particular approach? Uh, sure thing. So, um, after my many years in Virginia, full confession here, it's the first year I've worked with Chamberson of all things. <laughs> really. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so uh, the, the reason for doing this experiment were twofold, both stylistic and practical. The stylistic component is this, uh, this, this, this Chamberson goes into a blend that uh, we make for Upper Shirley that has a Chamberson component, as well as a Bordeaux component. Um, and it's also ha always had a little, little bit, three, four, five percent of Viognier, so I thought the interesting if we're going to add the Viognier to, to do it up front rather than later. And on, on the practical side, so, um, you know, we, we've all, we've all s stood by the press until way too late at night waiting for the, you know, more yield to come out of the Viognier. Um, so one of the things that makes it uh, uh, good, good against fungal disease in the vineyard makes it super tough to uh, extract juice um, on, on the winery side of it. So, you know, I think, I think for every ton of Viognier grapes we're growing in the state, 50 to 100 liters per ton uh, are never making it in, in, into the winery. So I thought, hmm, well, can, can, we, can we grab some, some of that? So, yeah, yeah that, that was the, the, the reason, re reason for the trial. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll go through the, the slides, but Mike, stay with me as we go so that we can uh, talk through them together. Let's see. Did that go? There we go. Are we live? There we go. Okay. Yeah. So as as Michael said, this was this is a Chamberson and and Viognier, um, and again for all those those reasons he just talked about. In this case, it was um, ten percent Chamberson and eighty percent. I'm sorry, uh, hundred percent Chamberson in the control, and then eighty percent Chamberson, twenty percent Viognier um, in the treatment. And again, this was these were this was pressed Viognier, correct, Mike? Uh, yeah, so, so it was a de-stemmed uh, pressed Viognier that was stored overnight in a cold room and then add, added to the Chamberson the next day. Okay, um, and when, when, we, when you talk about that 20%, so Doug clarified that that for him was about skin, was that this was about sort of overall um, weight for you, correct? Yeah, so, so this, this was 20% by weight, so um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and then when we look through these, we want to think just a little bit about sort of if you're adding Viognier, Viognier, we kind of already see Viognier being kind of a high pH for a white grape. Um, so what is that going to mean for the, for the chemistry of, or the pH chemistry to begin with? And then as Michael was saying, what about that efficiency? Can we get some more volume from that Viognier that we haven't gotten just by pressing it? Um, and then lastly, what are sort of the sensory impacts that we have for that? So when we look at the, the chemistry of it, um, just the primary juice chemistry, and, and Michael, 
when you guys take your, your primary juice chemistry on reds, this is after they've been destemmed and as they've sort of had a bunch of time but right before you inoculate, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. So at this point, we can already see some of the impact of that, those VNA skins being in there and that the pH has already gone up um, a couple of clicks there. So we already have a higher pH because we've got that high potassium VNA in there. Um, and the TA has already started to fall out a little bit um, on that particular fermentation. Um, and then when you look at the, the fermentation kinetics, in this case, again, uh, they're mostly happening the, pretty much uh, with, with each other. Um, and in this case, they were, both of them were pretty warm. So um, one of, I think the co-fermentation was a little bit warmer faster, but both of them nice warm fermentations. Um, so then when we look at the wine chemistry, the, the pH on the wine chemistry kind of follows along with the pH that we saw in the, in the, the juice itself or in the must, um, with that co-ferment having a, a fairly, a, a notably higher pH than the, the control did. Um, and we did take the potassium number on this one, and you can see the potassium in that co-fermentation was also higher than it was in the control. Um, but it, but I think the most interesting thing is, is really the yield here. Michael, do you want to talk about what you saw with the yield? Yeah, so with, with, with the yield, so we, we're doing, with the controls at 100% Schammerstein, so, so we get what we get. And then with the tr treatment where we have 80% Schammerstein and we're adding in 20% Viognier skins, you know, the question is like, are, you know, you, you'd expect to get some, some juice, but you wouldn't expect to get as much juice as you would with with fresh skins we, we found out that we got the same yield in both the treatment and the control so we got a bunch of free juice there so um you know we got the 20 percent peonier skins contributed as much yield as 20 percent fresh uh, chamberson grapes would have in in in, the, in this trial and that's that's kind of cool so yeah yeah we got a kind of extra bar barrel and a half uh, of um, Ch Chamberson Viognier out of a two and a half ton lot. That, that's pretty impressive to me, I think, <laughs> to think that there's that much yield in there to have. Um, so when we look at the color then, sorry, we look at the color, um, this gets back to Matthew's original point. In, in this case, we don't see any, any of that sort of bump that we would think from the color. We do see a dilution of color in the co-fermentation. Um, but the other thing to realize here, if, if we look at the overall intensity numbers, these, this is a high intensity color. And so the question would be for our, our panelists who are looking at these wines, when you're looking at the color of those two, um, you know, does, does it look like that co-ferment um, is that a noticeable difference in color for you or something that makes you feel like it has um, less intensity that way? Does it look different? Yeah, for, for me, for me there's, a, there's a striking difference between the two. The straight Chamberson is, is, is much darker and the, uh, the, the, the blend is no, no lighter. It's got, it's got good color, but it's, it's lighter. Yeah, yeah. Nice. It, it is noticeable. I mean, like the, the difference of color is, uh, uh, and uh, again, getting back to the more brown orange uh, side on the on the one with the skin contact. Okay, so it looks like it looks browner to you, less like of a bright red or purple almost. Chamberson has a sort of purpley color to it sometimes. I think too. So, okay. Yeah, I, I felt the, the straight up purple. The uh, sorry, the straight up Chamberson did have more of that purpley intensive almost a sappy look to the wine mm -hmm. um where the the vidal just looked a little a little cleaner a little more um uh clear but more than that just just a, a less intense of that purple okay yeah and when we look at the the anthocyanin numbers that kind of um goes along with with what we're what we're seeing in the um in that dilution of color. I think the, an interesting point here is when you look at the, the tannin compact, uh, the, the tannin itself, you actually have more tannin in the co-ferment than you do in the Chamberson. So again, sort of getting back to the idea that white grape skins have tannin in them. Um, and, and this sort of goes back to, to something we, we talked briefly about at the very beginning that like, hybrid grapes don't have as much tannin in them as vinifera grapes, whether they're red or white. 
So in this case, you've added sort of this vinifera grape in there, um, which, which probably has more tannin to give to begin with. So you actually see higher tannin in the co-ferment wine than you do in the, in the non-co-ferment wine. Um, okay, so I'm gonna come out of this. Sorry, managing the, okay, are we back? Okay, so somebody had asked if someone could hold up the, um, the, the wines to the camera. I'm gonna see, I don't know if you can see them or not, but we'll, we'll try to see. I don't know if you can see the differences at all. This one is the control. This one is the co-ferment. Um, I don't think you can probably see the color difference so well. Here. And maybe you can do. Huh? No, both red. They're both red. So here's the here's the control, and here's the co-ferment. So either way, they both still have very good color. It's just if you're looking at them straight on, um, you know, one and the other, one is a little bit less intense than the other one. Okay. So what about other sensory in uh, sensory uh, feedback that you have? First of all, do they taste different from each other for you in the other and the aromas and the flavors? And if so, how? You want me to start? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Mike, stop. It's, it's your wine. Go, go, okay. go. Sure. So, um, yeah, yeah. So for me, me, the 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 difference is dr dramatic. The uh, the co, co fermentation has this kind of over the top, I guess, kind of Viognier Chamberson component to it. Might be picking up on a little bread. I don't know about about you all. I thought I thought I got a little, little bit, but I, I don't know if it's some, some, something else there. Um, so for, for for me, it's it's too much on its own. But the the wine that's going to be going into this would be about fifteen percent of the final blend. So it uh, maybe at that that point might be a little too too low to have any impression. But yeah, yeah, the the, the wines are very very distinct for me. Um, so. You know, I, th I think maybe to Doug's point from from earlier, the the straight Chambersin to to me would be more interesting for maybe a varietal wooded aged Ch Chambersin, and the, this other other one with the co co pigmentation. It's kind kind of interesting for the blend that's going into. So yeah, yeah, I'm happy happy with the difference. Okay, others. Um, I mean, uh, myself, I, I really like the. Um, the hundred percent Chambosa, uh, better than the one with the Viognier. Uh, I mean, it was tasting more like a Chambosa. I mean, like in a, but as a um, as a glue glue wine, I'd like to say. I mean, you know, it's a light, a good, a good acid, uh, uh, soft tannin, but I think it's uh, it's very, it's going to be very pleasant. It's need a bit of oxygen, but as soon as it's going to open up, I think it's going to be a very, very nice wine. I mean, a very, very nice, easy going wine. Uh, the the other one with a uh, with a viognier we definitely have a, for me a change of like uh, the aromatic uh, profile. It's much more floral, but much more almost like uh, potpourri a little bit like that. You know, I, I, it's, for me it's, it goes too far away from what the Chambord Saint supposed to taste like, whether we like it or not. Um, and it's given a bit more of a kind of like uh, musty, skunky component almost that I don't. You know, I, I mean, it's uh, it's it's not. The wine is clean, there's no problem with it, but I, there's something that just like, that I don't care for. Uh, so, and I think on the mouthfeel, we've talked about the mouthfeel earlier, I feel here we've got much more bitterness, like as a finish is much more bitter. Uh, uh, we've got less acid perception and, and, and almost a, a soapy component uh, on, on the mouthfeel. So again, I, I think as a, as a blending tool, it's a, uh, it's a good option. But uh, as, as a wine individually, I, I, I much, much prefer the first one um, than the, the one with the beauty. Doug? So um, the, the thing that popped at me with the, uh, the Viognier uh, blend was uh, black raspberries. So I grow some here on the farm, and they just have this intense floral character that just jumps out at you up front. And it's kind of weird. And if you... And, and, it could be perceived as that, that funk, but maybe there was a little other funk going on, but definitely that floral character of the Viognier came through. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's art style. It's, is what's it going to go into and what are you trying to, 
to share with people. Um, and whereas the, the Chamberson on its own, I mean, boy, that was some intense stuff, you know, the pe that versus mine, I felt like mine was a little thinner, a little leaner as far as that sap level. This one is pop, bam, in your face with that character, which, you know, sometimes we, we poo poo Norton because it's so Norton-y. This is Chamberson. It's pretty chamberson -y, but, but good if you like that style. And, and that's that magic of what, what the heck do they want this year? Or have you created your own art in a way that the customers know it, they're happy with it, just maintain the style that you have and, and people will be happy again and again. Yeah, I, have, I have to give a shout out here to Phil Potton and Oakencroft who brought us some fabulous Chamberson grapes to work with. Good. So, so if it sounds like for your first foray into Chamberson, Michael, you did pretty well. Ooh. Really nice. I mean, it's a nice Chamberson. It's got concentration to it. So it's great. Okay. Any other questions for Michael Henney about this before we, before we jump into Mechie's, um, Mechie's experiment? I think we are good. So if you do, if you do think of something, you can just write it in the chat, and we will um, come up. We'll we can address it when we come back. So, okay. So Matthew, tell us about your co-fermentation experiment. What did you co-ferment, and why? Uh, petit Verdot and Petit Mansang. Uh, just because they start out with Petit, and I see it's easy to do. So you know, uh, I'm like probably the same grapes anyway. You know, it's like Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, all the same. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, um, we uh, we're leasing a, a vineyard that uh, has got some uh, petit verdot and some petit mansin. And uh, when I was uh, doing my, uh, it wasn't planned experimentation at all. Uh, as you know, I've done it at the last minute. Uh, but I was sampling the the fruit on, on the vineyard, and uh, I noticed that the petit verdot and the petit mansin was. Uh, about the same way, uh, you know, in, in break table uh, at our time. And, uh, and uh, Petit Verdot is always a problem because uh, we can have a lot of potassium and therefore even if the, the acid and the pH can seem good, very good at harvest, once we're done uh, uh, with fermentation, the pH can be very high. So I'm like, instead of, uh, you know, uh, let's try to see if I can correct the acid by adding uh, a varietal like Petit Mansang that's very well known to have a very, very low pH and a lot of acid. Uh, it didn't work as planned, obviously, because I also extracted the potassium from, from the Petit Mansang skin and, uh, and um, you know, having a, a pH that was higher at the end. But the idea was to harvest, I've harvested the Petit, uh, the petit Verdot uh, and the Petit Mansang at the same time. So some people would like to call that a, a field blend. Um, but uh, to be able to do the experimentation, I harvest it separately. And then I process them, distemp them into um, uh, at, at the same time. So one, one of the being at 25% of, uh, of Petit Mansang, but it's, we're talking about berries. So it was distemp, uh, not crushed, but distemp, both of them, uh, the control and treatment. So that's more or less what happened okay okay so let's we'll, we'll look through the chemistry and then we'll talk about um what it tastes like there we go there we go okay so again petite verdot petite men saying <clears throat> and as mitch you said the the control is 100 percent petite verdot and then the treatment would be 75 percent petite verdot 25 percent petite men saying so at each experiment we're sort of ratcheting up how much of that that second grape we've got in. And again, as Mitchu said, this is whole berries, not just the, the pumice or the skins. And so we're getting juice from those berries as well. Um, and so this is what it looks like in what it looked like in the bin when when it a nice was picture. and it was all destemmed, right? It was? Yes. It makes very nice pictures. It makes like, for very nice pictures. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a striking difference there. So um, it's a bit of a yin and a yang look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That might be in the cropping, but it, it did sort of have that like swirliness to it. So, okay. So when we look at the chemistry, um, we can see that at, at the at the initial juice stage that we did see the pH um, come down just a little bit with the petit mensang. 
Um, however, when we look at the finished wine, that didn't seem to be the case. Um, and and Matthew, do you want to, I think you touched on that already about the, how when we make our white wine, we don't really in, include the potassium that's in the skins. Whereas- Yeah, when, when we press the piment tank, we don't extract any potassium or very little. Uh, but as soon as you uh, do a, a skin contact for, for three weeks, uh, then you end up, uh, you definitely end up having uh, having much more potassium, and you, you can't see it in the results. So it's uh, I ended up having a higher pH uh, than than the, than the control. So, yeah. Right, right, um, yeah. So we see that with that higher potassium number, and the the pH didn't really seem to move um, too much for us there. And we again with the color, we do see that dilution in color um, that we would expect in adding 25% white juice in there. Um, so again, not a, not a situation where we've got a, a help in color. But again, this is a really high color intense wine. And so um, the question would be whether, whether that's something that, that matters or not in the longer term. So, or in, in sort of the perception of the wine. Um, and we also, when we're looking at the anthocyanins, we can see that there's, you know, there's a, a, a notable reduction in the, the anthocyanins along the way that go along with that color difference, all of which is, is consistent. Um, but once again, when we look at the phenolics, it, it, we have a little bit of dip in, in tannin in the, in the co-fermentation, probably because Petit Bordeaux is such a high tannin wine to begin with. Um, but we don't really see a 25% dip because again, those Petit Mansang grapes do bring some tannin in with them. Um, okay, so let's, let's go back to our panel here. We go there we go okay so what about you guys maybe first i'll hold up the wine so that our audience can see the color for themselves but if you guys want to start to uh comment on the color i don't know if i can get so this is the control on that one so the 100 percent petite bordeaux and this is the the co-ferment so the the petite bordeaux petite men sank so again just you know from what you could see from the little camera it doesn't look like a big difference, but I don't know for you guys when you're looking at them here with a white background, can you see that, that color difference? I, I couldn't see it. I saw a little bit in the glass and that seemed to work okay. Um, but I, yeah, I, I couldn't see it on the screen. I mean, it, it is, a, there's a difference. I mean, it's visible, uh, but on the screen, I wasn't able to see it. Yeah, I wasn't able to see it on the screen. When I looked at them on my piece of paper, I, 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 when, I, when I did these blind earlier, I did note that the control was darker than the, than the other one. But. Yeah, I think, yeah for, for me, there's a noticeable, noticeable difference in color as well as hue, like uh, Matt Matthews had noticed <laughs> on the other wines. But yeah, for me, it's pr pretty dramatic. The uh, right. um, Petit, Petit Man saying Petit Bordeaux a little more on the brown end of the spectrum and, and, and lighter. Yeah. So what again, I, is, oh, go ahead. I, I didn't do the experimentation uh, with color in mind. So that wasn't the, I mean, like I, I knew based on my previous experimentation on, on co-fermentation that I most likely get less color. So that's, I, I wasn't worried about the color, especially with Petit Verdot, usually that's not a concern. So. Right. So what about the aromas and the flavors? What do you guys, what do you guys think? Do they seem different to you? If so, how? And do you like one better than the other? So I'll go first this time. Um, I felt the straight up one, uh, the, there was the, almost a smokiness. The wood came through very nicely. Okay, I don't know what wood it was in, but it really, the, the oak element was there. Where the, the blend, um, boy, there's a citrus in there. Mm -hmm. It's just, I guess it's from the acid, but it really just, you know, it's a, um, it brought me to almost an orange juice screwdriver kind of thing. Um, I mean, obviously there's red wine in there too, but I just got that nice, clean uh, citrus fruit showing through. Okay. I actually saw that too, Doug, when I was, I, I felt like the, the control just had a real petite verdoiness to it. It had all that dark fruit to it. It had a real expression of kind of that brooding fruit of Petit Verdot, um, whereas the co-ferment had like this, this brightness to it at the same time as you had that other piece of it. And it was, it was like, I think I had orange blossoms and citrus in my tasting note as well. Yeah, my, my, my take on it was a little, little bit 
different in that I, I love the control as a classic, beautiful, layered petite Bordeaux. Um, the uh, petite man sang treatment, I found it a bit to the kind of boozy end of the spectrum, seemed, seemed a little hot and alcoholic to me. Uh, looking like at the lab work, that looks like it's somewhat mod moderate for uh, 2019, uh, 14%. Um, but uh, yeah, the uh, uh, ex ex experiment was, wasn't kind of bringing much to the wine for me. What about you? Uh, go ahead. No, no I was no. asking you. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for me, uh, just to get back to uh, to you, Doug, uh, the, the the oak profile is exactly the same. It's uh, we've got barrels same age. Uh, uh, it's a it's a blend of different barrels, but the barrels are on the on the are exactly identical. So the the, the oak perception should be very similar than, uh, on on both wines. So the only difference in uh, in oak perception here will be uh, what the wine can take or don't take. Uh, so I mean, so. Uh, uh, Regarding the, the wine on its on itself, I, I do um, come back to what you said, uh, Joy. Is I think the the single uh, the hundred percent Petit Verdot tastes like Petit Verdot. Uh, I mean, there's no question about. I mean, this, it it's it's a Petit Verdot. There's no you don't brainstorm too much to know where where you're gonna get the wine. Um, the other one is um, it's. Uh, uh, Makes you think more about what it could be. So it tastes, it's less, a, it's less of a petit verdo, and it seems obvious when you had 25% of something else. But if um, uh, I've, I've got trouble deciding which one I like the, the most, I think the, I, I do like the petit verdo the most for a petit verdo. If I'm trying to, do, to make a petit verdo, I think the petit verdo 100% tastes more like a petit verdo, and therefore is more interesting for that specific uh, content. I think the other one, um, again, we, it's, I feel like there's a bit more tannin, it's a bit more floral, a bit more citricky. Uh, there's, uh, there's also a tad more acid. I've got a, uh, the acid perception is a bit higher. So that also for me could be um, uh, participating to the perception of heat uh, that Michael was describing. Uh, but I, I, I I'm, I'm still going to try to edge uh, these two wines for another year almost uh, to see how they how they change uh, and how they evolved. Uh, I, I will try most likely to uh, to bottle the the blend as a as a single batch uh, just because it's fun and I can do it. But uh, but I'm you know again I'm I'm not disappointed by the result. I had no idea what, what I was looking for anyway. I just find it different than, uh, than the other one and I, I might keep it this way. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you might keep, keep them separate and see how they age a little bit. <coughs> the, the one note that I did have on the, on the co-fermentation was that um, it seemed like you sort of have this, like the, the citrus gives you this sort of high, this like strong front high note and then you kind of have the brooding part of the Petit Verdot and there's sort of, they, they need to meet in the middle a little bit. So I, I'll be interested to see if that sort of integrates in as it's in the cellar a little bit longer to see if they sort of, you know, come to meet each other to give you this like maybe broader range than you normally get with a Petit Verdot um, in, that, in that sense. So. Yeah. Um, so any other observations that you all wanna make about any of the projects or if there's any questions out there um, remaining for any of our panelists about the projects. Um, we've got a couple of, of... Okay, so, so Rick Tag is asking, um, could some of the tannin or flavor result, uh, this is on the last experiment with, with Michael Heine's experiment, could some of the tannins or flavors result from how, pre how hard Viognier was pressed? So um, maybe, Maybe Rick, can you do you want to speak into to your question there? You can un unmute yourself. You mean because of the bitterness or the bitterness that Matthew picked up? Myself. Oh, oh there you there are. You are. Uh, all right. There you are. So okay. yeah, I was I was just thinking that you know th there was such a a degree of tannins. It's almost like having a how if the grapes are pressed too hard or pressed relatively hard, 
that you're going to have an extraction of almost like a, a, a skin extraction from a cold soak with the, especially if you get more juice. And I was just thinking if that's where the, the bitterness might be coming from is having the extended skin contact with, I guess, what's session, essentially bruised fruit. Does that make sense? I don't know if it makes sense or not. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I th think I get where you're coming from, Rick, but, um, you know, and per per perhaps that, that's the case, but I, you know, I think maybe the overriding thing is we're just tossing a bunch of bunch of skins in there with with the the approach that that we took because of course we're concentrating the skins because they've already been pressed and unlike, unlike on Doug's trial it was twenty percent by 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 weight um, but uh, yeah so I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not sure 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 there but uh, you know so certainly on our Viognier we're we're not you know try, trying to squeeze out every last drop there no I wasn't saying that so, but I was just thinking about it so. <laughs> <laughs> so then we we also have a question from Jeff Sanders um, on the on the Chamberson co fermentations. Any thoughts on the aging potentials of these? Do you do you feel like like any of the co fermentation helped the aging potential of um, of the Chamberson? And if here, I'll see if I can unmute Jeff. And, and Jeff, if you want to um, talk into that a little bit. Um, Let's see. I, I, I think it, it does probably help. I mean, for, for me, based on what I've tasted, I will say that the one with, uh, uh, with uh, the skin, I, we probably have more tannin anyway, and I think it will help a little bit of the, the aging of the wine. Uh, but that's my two cents. Okay. Um, just thoughts on aging potential, yeah. Yeah, just for me, I I feel anytime you're adding tannins, almost any time, you're going to help that wine age a little bit longer. That's just one of those building blocks of ageability. Um, you know, with our Chamberson, we've always, I always throw some oak chips in there. I'm doing a little bit of uh, uh, enological tannins and then the skins on top of that. So we're trying to build some structure that this thing will last, you know, for a number of years. And so far, so good. I don't put it in my library because a lot of people aren't thinking about a Chamberson, but when I do find one, it's like, Hey, yeah, it's still tasting good. And we're here eight years later. And that's a surprising thing. So, yeah. And with, with, with our, our, our trial, the, the goal was to make a component for an early drinking red. Mm -hmm. And despite having the higher tannins in there, we do have a higher pH and a low, lower acid and one of its chief attributes being being the aromatic. So, you know, perhaps there's some aging potential there, but, um, you know, it was really the goal was for an earlier drinking red, and I think it was a successful component of that intended goal. Um, and then we have another question. Did any of the panelists use enzymes? And if so, did they amplify the potential effects of co-fermentation? So did anybody use enzymes? And maybe we can think together of whether we feel like that would would make a difference in in what we're seeing in the results. No, I I, I don't use enzyme. I mean, I know, especially not on the on the year like uh, uh, like last year uh, where it was very ripe. You know, when you've got the natural ripeness of, of the of the berries, I, I don't I don't have the need of enzyme. Um, so, but that's a personal choice. So you know, it's. Uh, yeah, I'm doing fairly long. I'm doing fairly, also. I'm doing fairly long extended maceration on my wines. Um, so you know the alcohol that's produced at the end of the fermentation would help me more to extract the tannin than the enzyme will do. Yeah, and with with our, our wines, we did a sta standard en enzyme add on both the control and, and and the treatment. So yeah, there wasn't really a com comparison in uh, enzyme versus not not using enzyme. And I'm in, more in Mike's camp on this one is that, yeah, there's standard uh, enzyme addition, kind of almost a, we, one of our regulars. Yeah. And with Doug's experiment too, I feel like, um, you know, when we did see in the Merlot treatment, we saw that, that higher amount of tannin, which we would expect adding vinifera back into, um, into uh, hybrid because hybrids have less to begin with. But also that Merlot had 
essentially already seen some alcohol in its first fermentation. And mm -hmm. in that particular experiment, we saw more of the seed tannins as well. And so I think you probably got some additional extraction of seed tannin from the Merlot just because those seed tannins had started to be broken down by the alcohol from the first fermentation. Um, and so that's one thing that we might keep in mind too, is that if you're using, like in that particular case where you already had some of that breakdown, you kind of, it sort of goosed the, the tannin extraction along the way, um, which isn't about enzymes, but it is about extraction, so. Okay, any other, any other questions for our panelists? Other questions, okay. I will check back one more time before we go, but let's just do a really quick wrap up here. I do have a, a summary slide so we can kind of look at, at all of these because I think there's one kind of more thing to see here. So when we think about our, our co-fermentation, again, we did see changes in the chemistry and the sensory characteristics of these wines. You know, we would love to make it so that everybody can taste these wines and we hope for the day that we can all get together to do that again. Um, that we might have an opportunity, for example, at the Virginia Wineries Association next year to kind of taste through some of these things that we're not getting to taste this way, because these we really did see a, a sensory difference. Um, in most of the cases that we looked at, we did not see sort of that, that bump in, in color because we're adding in co-pigments. So as Mathieu said, in his experience, he hadn't really seen that happen. We did not see that happen either, except that one potential um, Ex that one potential example with um, Doug Chamberson and his Vidal pum pumice, which at least held its own in terms of color, if not getting a little bit of bump. Um, but all of the, when we look at the, the effect on the other phenolics and particularly the tannins, um, any, any of the Chamberson experiments, we saw an increase in tannin with co-fermentation. So we saw an increase with, with Doug's Vidal, we saw an increase with Doug's Merlot, and we saw an increase with Michael's Viognier co-fermentation. So there is something in sort of giving a little bit more tannin to Chamberson by adding those other components back in. Mathieu's, we didn't see very much of an effect on the tannin at all. Um, with the Petit Bordeaux and the Petit Mansang, again, two vinifera species. And I look back in the, in the uh, WRE archives, there's two other experiments in the, in the archives of the WRE, one that Emily did at Veritas in 2015 with Cab Franc and Viognier, and also she actually saw a decrease in the tannin in that, in that situation. And Petit Bordeaux and Viognier done by Hunting Creek in 2017, and they also saw a decrease. So when we're thinking about the effects of co-fermentation, um, just realizing what it is we're trying to accomplish with that and which, which grapes we're pairing up with one another, um, it is useful to think about you know, which ones are actually gonna be sort of giving us more structure and which ones are gonna be taking away from our structure. And again, I think that ultimately goes back to that idea that, that our hybrids really do start with less tannin to begin with. So they're gonna bring less tannin to the party whether we're co-fermenting with them or if we're not co-fermenting with them. Um, so let me see, let me get out of that. Let me just check and make sure we don't have any other, um, any other questions that have come in. I think we are cleared of questions. If you do think of additional questions, please, um, please feel free to email me and I can kind of put you in touch with any of the panelists that might be, um, that, that might be the right one to answer that question. Just to give you a quick little view going forward, the WRE, we're gonna just keep trying to do some more interactive things as we're all kind of not able to meet together. Um, we are working on a plan to do a, a WRE style tasting with all of you having the wines. Um, you can imagine there's some logistical challenges to that that we're working out, but hopefully um, we have a good experiment chosen for that. It'll just be one experiment the first time because you can imagine how many little bottles I'll be sending everybody. But when you do get that, that invitation, please do RSVP um, relatively promptly so I can make sure to get you the wines before we get to the actual um, uh, live chat discussion. So um, so with that, I want to make sure to thank each of my panelists. Thank you to Mathieu and to Michael and to Doug for doing these experiments and spending, uh, spending your time with us today. We also want to make sure to um, thank the Virginia Wine Board who funds the Winemakers Research Exchange, does that in a very um, generous way for us and we're thankful for them providing the resources to do that. Um, in, and I think I've had a couple, we've, I've had a, an um, uh, 
a request for the slides from today, which I will post, but also on the Debrary website, there's sort of some introductory material for co-fermentation and the reports for each of these um, experiments. So if you want to sort of get into the, the specifics of those, you can feel free to take a look. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, it looks like you want to say something. Don't you? Yeah, Joy, just uh, thank you to you and the work you've done to give us the opportunity to taste these uh, as I think the only wine board member on the on the group today. Um, money well spent. Uh, we're happy to see as the challenges that we have right now, you know, some things are still moving forward and, um, you know, let's keep doing. So good work. Great. Well, thank you so much, Doug, and thank you again for, for your input and the day as well. So Thanks everybody for your time today. Um, I will stay on for just a few minutes if anybody has questions or, or comments to stay on, so. Terrific, thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.